My name is John Lindahl. I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Museum of Nebraska History on the third Thursday of every month. And a detailed schedule for this series, as well as information about all the Historical Society's programs and services, can be found on our website, which is nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Today's speaker is Tom Thiessen, who's a retired National Park Service archaeologist who has an interest in military history. Tom worked for the National Park Service for more than 33 years. Most of the time was spent at the Midwest Archaeological Center here in Lincoln with shorter assignments in Denver and the Knife River Indian Village's National Historic Site in North Dakota. His topic today is Wallace Cadet Taylor and the last U.S. Volunteers. Taylor was an officer from Omaha who served in two volunteer regiments. Please welcome Tom Thiessen. Well, thank you, John. And uh, thank you, folks, for venturing out in this dismal weather that just doesn't seem like it'll go away. Um, My talk will focus on this man, Wallace Cadet Taylor, a little-known Nebraska officer from Omaha who served with distinction in both the Spanish-American and the <coughs> Philippine-American Wars. I will outline his service as a U.S. volunteer officer in the Philippines and make brief mention of his later career as one of the ranking officers of the Philippine Constabulary. I first became aware of Taylor during my research that I did for the Nebraska State Historical Society's 1989 exhibit about Nebraska's role in the Spanish-American and Philippine-American Wars. Taylor was one of 12 captains who commanded companies in the 1st Nebraska Volunteer Infantry, and he clearly stood out in that group because of his personal courage and soldierly abilities. As I looked more into his background, I learned of his service as a captain in the 39th U.S. Volunteer Infantry and his later career in the Philippine Constabulary. In this talk, I will also use Wallace Taylor's military service to illustrate the similarities and differences between the last two sets of U.S. Army organizations that saw combat under the title of U.S. Volunteers. By this, I mean the state regiments of U.S. Volunteers raised in 1898 for the Spanish-American War and the federal U.S. Volunteer regiments that were formed in 1899 to replace the state volunteers in the Philippines. These two organizations, the state volunteers and the federal volunteers, came into existence under different circumstances, were formed in different ways, and had different characteristics. Both kinds of volunteers served in the Philippines as part of the 8th Corps of the U.S. Army, later renamed the Division of the Philippines. Citizen soldiers are a long-standing tradition in the United States. Militia, volunteers, and National Guardsmen have augmented the regular army establishment in nearly every instance of national conflict since revolutionary times. During certain conflicts that include the Mexican War and the Civil War, as well as the Spanish-American and Philippine-American Wars, citizen soldiers were mustered into federal service as United States volunteers. Wallace Cadet Taylor was born on May 26, 1872, in the small rural Illinois town of Winona. His father was Cadet Taylor, the uh, local postmaster, and his mother was Emma Barker. Young Wallace was educated in the schools of Washington, D.C., where his father served as chief clerk of the government printing office for four years in the 1880s. His high school education was completed in Omaha after the family moved there in the late 1880s, uh, and he's essentially a graduate of Central High School. He also enlisted as a private in a local militia company known as the Thurston Rifles when the company was formed in 1893. The company was named after John Mellon Thurston, a United States Senator from Nebraska. It became one of two National Guard companies based in Omaha, the other being known as the Omaha Guards. Wallace Taylor was appointed captain of the Thurston Rifles in December 1897. 
the United States and Spain declared war on each other in late April 1898. The U.S. Army at that time was minuscule in size, less than 30,000 officers and men to face a Spanish force of approximately 200,000 on Cuba alone. Uh, it's interesting to think that our, the, our entire army at that time was less than the number of men sent to uh, Iraq as uh, the so-called surge. To enlarge the army, state governors, congressmen, and National Guardsmen lobbied fiercely for the National Guard regiments to be federalized as U.S. volunteers. On April 23rd, the President issued a call for 125,000 men to augment the regular army and to serve as volunteers for the duration of the war or a period of two years. This manpower need was to be met by federalizing in mass most of the existing National Guard units in accordance with a quota levied on individual states. About a month later, another call for 75,000 more men was also issued. Ultimately, over 275,000 Americans served under arms during the Spanish War, and about 200,000 of them were volunteers, mostly federalized National Guardsmen. Men flocked enthusiastically to the colors. Even before the President's first call for men, Captain Taylor wrote to the Adjutant General of the Nebraska National Guard on April 19th to offer the services of his company, quote, to go wherever ordered and for whatever length of time, end quote. In early May, Taylor and his men arrived in Lincoln, and on May 9th, he was mustered into federal service as Captain of Company L of the 1st Nebraska Infantry United States Volunteers. This photograph shows the Thurston Rifles uh, formed up outside their armory in Omaha, uh, getting ready to, uh, to leave for Lincoln. The man with the sword is Wallace Taylor. Like most officers in the state volunteer regiments that were federalized at that time, Wallace Taylor was commissioned by the governor of his state, not as a result of any competitive examination to determine fitness for command. Consequently, the state volunteers, even though mustered into federal service and under federal command, were ultimately responsible to state authorities. <clears throat> this was one of the important differences between the state volunteers and the later federal volunteers, which were under the, fully under the authority of the War Department. The state volunteer regiments were largely composed of men from their respective states, and individual companies were typically recruited from single communities within those states. This strong local character was true of the Nebraska Regiment. Of the 137 officers and men who served in Company L of the first, of the first Nebraska during its period of federal service, only 12 were not Omaha residents, and only three of those 12 were from outside Nebraska. In this sense, the National Guard of 1898 was not truly national at all. As military historians have often pointed out, the Guard then was actually 45 separate state armies, differently trained and equipped, and of course responsible to their respective state governments. The federal volunteer regiments formed in the latter part of 1899, in contrast, were recruited from large regions of the nation and lacked this marked state and local character. The 1st Nebraska Volunteers were part of a large force assembled in May and June at San Francisco to invade the Philippine Islands. Captain Taylor and the men of Company L entrained with their regiment and arrived at Camp Merritt, the assembly point at San Francisco, on May 19th and 20th. After a month or so at Camp Merritt, the Nebraska Regiment embarked with the 2nd Expedition of U.S. troops bound for the Philippines and reached Manila on July 17th on board the transport SS Senator. The 1st Nebraska participated in the brief fighting before Manila in July and August, and in the assault that resulted in the capitulation of the city on August 13th, which ended hostilities with Spanish forces in the Philippines. In this photograph, you see the men of the 1st Nebraska marching in their assigned position during the assault which was on the extreme left of the American line that actually placed them in the seawater. Throughout the fall of 1898, the regiment remained in and near Manila as part of the American occupation force. In December, the 1st Nebraska went into camp at a place called Santa Mesa, outside of Manila. <clears throat> 
Captain Taylor was assigned duty as a battalion commander at Camp Santa Mesa, an increase in the scope and responsibility of his command, although the assignment was only temporary. Although hostilities with Spain had ceased, the volunteers were kept in the Philippines awaiting the ratification of the peace treaty with Spain, which did not occur until February 6, 1899. However, two days before that date, another war erupted in the Philippines, which kept the volunteers there even longer to deal with this new military emergency. This war was fought with Filipino nationalists who sought independence and self-rule. It was viewed by Americans as an insurrection against American authority, even though American authority extended little beyond the immediate environs of Manila at that time. The 1st Nebraska was the first American unit to fire a shot in this new war. During the fall and winter of 1898 and 1899, tensions between Americans and Filipinos had increased and armed conflict was imminently expected. The breaking point occurred during the evening of February 4th when a Nebraska sentry fired on several Filipino soldiers who responded mockingly to a challenge. Within minutes, the firing had spread all along the American line encircling Manila and the Philippine-American War had started. Just coincidentally, this photograph was taken on uh, that same day when the Philippine-American War started, on February 4th, uh, earlier in the day. Taylor is seated in the middle and flanked by the two lieutenants of Company L. During the remainder of that night and the next day, February 5th, fire was exchanged between the American and Filipino lines. Captain Taylor's gallant behavior on February 4th and 5th earned him the recommendation of his regimental commander for a promotion to the rank of Brevet Major. This was the first of several recommended rewards for gallantry in action that mostly eluded him during his service with both sets of U.S. volunteer organizations. Captain Taylor repeatedly stood out from his fellow company commanders in the 1st Nebraska for his exceptional leadership, energy, and personal bravery during the opening actions of the Philippine-American War. On March 25, 1899, while leading his men in a charge against an entrenched Filipino position at San Francisco del Monte that resulted in hand-to-hand -hand combat, Taylor was wounded by a gunshot in the right forearm. Nine other Nebraska men were also wounded in that action. Thereafter, for most of April and May, and the remainder of the 1st Nebraska's active campaigning in the Philippines, Captain Taylor was confined to the 1st Reserve Hospital in Manila or to his quarters, recuperating from his wound and also from malaria. On April 23rd, the regimental commander, Colonel John Stotzenberg, was killed in action. One of the battalion commanders was subsequently promoted to the rank of colonel in Stotzenberg's place. And on April 28th, Wallace Taylor was promoted to the rank of major of volunteers. He did not see active campaigning with the regiment after that promotion, however. A major U.S. offensive simply ran out of steam after reaching the town of San Fernando in mid-May because over half of the American force was exhausted and ill. The strength of the Nebraska regiment was down to around 300 men, about one-third of the regiment's complement at the outbreak of war with the Filipinos four months earlier. The Nebraska Regiment was recalled to Manila on May 20th and spent the next month doing light duty in and around the capital city. This is Company L of the 1st Nebraska uh, with Taylor in the photograph. Somewhere, I'm not sure exactly where. While in the hospital in May, Major Taylor received an order from Major General Elwell Otis, the commander of the 8th Corps, to report for an examination for the rank of second lieutenant in the regular army, an opportunity which had been requested by his father in Omaha through the good offices of Senator Thurston. Captain Taylor respectfully declined the examination on the grounds that he had no foreknowledge of the exam and he wished to accompany his men on their return to the United States. He did indeed return to the States with his regiment on board the transport SS Hancock and was discharged with the rest of the Nebraska Regiment at the Presidio in San Francisco on August 23, 1899. Wallace Taylor soon returned to the Philippines as a member of another organization of U.S. volunteers. With the exchange of peace treaty ratifications between Spain and the United States on April 11, 1899, 
peace was formally at hand, and the volunteers in the Philippines were entitled to be discharged. However, they were kept in service because of the war then in progress against the Filipino nationalists, and because few regular army soldiers were available to replace them. The concept of stop loss is not new to today's army. The regular army was still recovering from the devastating effects of combat and disease experienced in the Caribbean theater of the Spanish-American War, as well as the discharge of experienced soldiers following the conclusion of that fighting. Political pressure from state governors and congressmen for the volunteers' return home mounted during the winter of 1898 and 1899, which resulted in the passage of the Army Bill on March 2nd. A key provision of that law was the creation of a temporary force of 35,000 U.S. volunteers to replace the state volunteers then serving in the Philippines. <coughs> Specifically, the law authorized the creation of 24 new regiments of infantry and one of cavalry for a term not to exceed two years. It also authorized the size of the regular army to be temporarily increased to 65,000 men. While the regular forces were being augmented and trained, these new regiments of U.S. volunteers would replace the state volunteers in the Philippines and would constitute the majority of U.S. military forces there. The federal volunteer regiments that formed during the, formed during the summer and fall of 1899 were different from the earlier state volunteer regiments in several ways. As I mentioned before, the new volunteers were responsible to the federal government, not to the state governments, as had the state volunteers before them. The officers and most of the enlisted men of the new volunteer regiments were experienced former soldiers from the regular army and the state volunteer regiments. An estimated 65% of the U.S. volunteers had seen service in state volunteer organizations, and most of the volunteer companies contained some ex-regular army men as well. The recruits had to be between the ages of 18 and 35, be able to speak English, be taller than 5 feet 4 inches, weigh between 120 and 190 pounds, and be of good character, able-bodied, and healthy. In short, they were a highly selected body of men. This contrasted with the earlier state volunteers, many of whom were federalized in mass from pre-existing National Guard units. The new volunteer regiments were only a temporary measure while the regular army was reorganizing and expanding to a size sufficient to garrison America's new overseas possessions. Because they were planned to be disbanded by July 1st, 1901, they would be in existence for only two years or less. No provision was made to provide replacements for combat or disease casualties during that time. When diminished in manpower, the regiments would remain depleted until they were disbanded. An effort was made to induce veterans of the state volunteers to stay in the Philippines and to re-enlist in these new volunteer regiments through payment of a $500 bounty. However, relatively few men took this payment. After nearly a year of arduous service in the tropical environment of the Philippine Islands, most simply wanted to return home. Two of the new infantry regiments and the single cavalry regiment were raised in the Philippines, the other 22 infantry regiments were recruited in the United States. John Scott Reed, who has written an insightful dissertation about the U.S. volunteers in the Philippines, has pointed out that the volunteer regiments raised in 1899 were basically filled with men who had been twice trained, first in the regular army or the state volunteers during the Spanish-American War, then as replacement volunteers to be sent to the Philippines during the fall of 1899. These new regiments received, on average, 70 days of training. When they arrived in the Philippines, they were combat ready, in contrast to the earlier state volunteers who were less prepared for the rigors of campaigning. Uh, but back to Wallace Taylor. A week after being discharged from the 1st Nebraska Regiment, Wallace Taylor was appointed a captain in, a 30, in the 39th U.S. Volunteer Infantry Regiment that was being recruited in 10 states ranging from Alabama and Pennsylvania through the upper Midwest to Washington State. Two battalions of the regiment were assembled and trained at Fort Crook near Omaha, and another battalion was assembled at Vancouver Barracks in Washington. The regimental commander was Colonel of Volunteers Robert Lee Bullard, 
With a permanent rank of captain in the subsistence department of the regular army, Bullard was the most junior officer selected to command any of the 25 new volunteer regiments. As commander of the 39th, he proved himself to be an aggressive and capable officer. The officers of the 39th Volunteers generally possessed earlier military experience. Among the 51 officers of the <coughs> regiment were 13 former regular army officers and 22 men with prior service as officers in the state volunteer regiments. After a brief period of leave to attend to personal matters and some recruiting service in Omaha, Captain Taylor joined the regiment at Fort Crook on September 28, 1899. He was assigned to command Company F and was once again assigned temporary battalion command responsibility as well. From September 30th into January 1900, he commanded the battalion of the 39th that was assembled at Vancouver Barracks. The entire regiment left Portland, Oregon in November on board the transports Olympia and Pennsylvania and arrived at Manila on December 7th. Some of Captain Taylor's fellow officers and enlisted men in the 39th are of interest. By the end of World War I, his regimental commander, Robert Lee Bullard, succeeded to the command of the 2nd Army of the American Expeditionary Force, a body of 180,000 men. He was one of only two officers to achieve the rank of Lieutenant General during the war. The 39th's Lieutenant Colonel, or second in command, was Enoch Crowder, who oversaw the national draft during World War I and is regarded as the father of the selective service system. One of the three battalion commanders was fellow Omahaan Major Harry Mulford, who had succeeded Stotzenberg as commander of the 1st Nebraska. Another battalion commander was Major John Parker, a regular Army 1st Lieutenant who had commanded a battery of Gatling guns at the San Juan Heights in Cuba in 1898, and was known by the nickname of Gatling Gun Parker. The 3rd Battalion Commander and Taylor's immediate superior was Major George T. Langhorn, an aristocratic Virginian cavalry officer who had been military attaché at the U.S. Embassy in Belgium. One of the lieutenants in Taylor's company was the son of former Confederate general and later U.S. diplomat Fitzhugh Lee, and there was even a Missourian in the regiment whose name was Jesse James, who was indeed a relative of the famous border ruffian and outlaw. By the end of December 1899, the 39th U.S. Volunteers relieved a beleaguered 21st U.S. Infantry garrison at the town of Calamba in Laguna Province. Plans were afoot for two American columns to undertake a coordinated offensive through the uh, southern provinces of Luzon and Batangas, the area south of, of this large lake in the center of the island. Initially, the 39th was not intended to take part in this operation. On his own initiative and without specific orders, Colonel Bullard energetically occupied several towns in the path of one of these offensive columns, the one commanded by Brigadier General Theodore Schwann. General Schwann was not pleased to see Bullard's potentially meddlesome activities interfere with his planned operations, so he ordered the colonel to return to Columba with one battalion of the 39th, and he added the other two battalions of the 39th, including Captain Wallace Taylor's company, to his offensive column. Taylor distinguished himself in the actions which followed. The first instance happened on January 21st, 1900, at a place called San Diego Hill, where strongly held Filipino in, uh, entrenchments held up the advance of the leading elements of Schwann's column. A frontal attack on the Filipino position was ordered, but before it could be carried out, Captain Taylor, with only a few men, flanked the entrenchment and routed the Filipino defenders. In a letter written to Cadet Taylor, uh, Wallace's father, Colonel Bullard reported Major Langhorne's observation that, quote, the enemy's fire suddenly ceased, and greatly to his astonishment, he saw an American stand up on a parapet of the enemy's works and wave his hat. It was Captain W.C. Taylor, who had with less than 20 men found a way around the flank and driven off by surprise and superb courage, a large force, at least 400 men, who had held their ground two hours before a whole brigade under an artillery fire at that." End quote. The next instance occurred the following day at a town called Mahaihai, 
which was reported to be defended by strong entrenchments and 1,500 to 3,000 determined defenders. The entrenchments controlled all movement on a narrow road leading into town and overlooked a deep rocky gorge or ravine with nearly perpendicular sides. Some of Langhorne's men, including Taylor, were lowered into the bottom of the gorge by means of ropes to reconnoiter. They were seen by the Filipinos who exchanged fire with them. The men rejoined the column, except for Captain Taylor and one corporal. Taylor observed the Filipino position for a time through a telescope, concluded that the defenders had abandoned the entrenchment, and with the corporal literally quaking in his boots, scaled the gorge and slipped into the fortification to find both it and the town deserted. The defenders had fled when they learned of the approach of another American force from behind the town. When these troops arrived, it is said that they found Captain Taylor sitting on the church steps enjoying a cigar. On the basis of his gallant conduct in action at San Diego Hill, Major Langhorne in September 1900 recommended Taylor first for the Medal of Honor and shortly afterward for a promotion to Brevet Lieutenant Colonel. The recommendations were endorsed by Colonel Bullard, but for reasons unknown, uh, Captain Taylor did not receive either recognition. Nor was this the only time that Wallace Taylor was recommended for a Brevet promotion while with the 39th Volunteers. <coughs> He is reported to have been again recommended for a brevet lieutenant colonelcy for gallantry in action nearby in Batangas province on March 10, 1900, where he is said to have, quote, ambushed an ambush. The 39th Volunteer Infantry campaigned in the southern part of Luzon Island in an area where resistance to American rule was especially tenacious and prolonged. The regiment's pacification duties did not consist solely of fighting and patrolling, but also garrisoning and protection of towns, building of schools, supervising road and bridge construction, building intelligence networks, overseeing election of officials and local governments, dispensing justice through provost courts, and promoting public health. During its service in the Philippines, which lasted about 15 months, the 39th Volunteer Infantry fought in 84 engagements. Half the regiment was lost to death, injury, and discharge because of sickness, and these losses were not replaced. The 39th had the reputation of being a, quote, sick regiment. During its campaigning in the Philippines, the 39th U.S. Volunteer Infantry suffered 113 disease deaths, 40 more than any other volunteer regiment, and it lost 13 men killed in action and 30 wounded. The regiment became so depleted and exhausted by October 1900 that it was shifted to another healthier area, the southwestern coast of Batangas province, where operations were less arduous. The 39th Volunteers also had many fewer desertions than average, and the second lowest total of general courts martial in the volunteer force, attesting to the excellent state of internal dis discipline within the regiment. Wallace Taylor's last service as an officer of the 39th was at Manila serving as boarding officer at the Customs House from January 19, 1901, to his being mustered out of service. The 39th U.S. Volunteer Infantry left Manila on March 16, 1901, and mustered out of federal service at San Francisco on May 6. Captain Wallace Taylor did not return to the States with the regiment, however. After mustering out in June, he chose to remain in the Philippines and open a new, and in many ways even more interesting, chapter of his life and service to his nation. Before I explain that, let me offer some concluding remarks about the U.S. Volunteers' service in the Philippines. The U.S. Volunteers who served in the Philippines in 1899 and early 1901, through early 1901, state and federal volunteers alike, bore the brunt of the conflict with Filipino nationalists in both conventional and guerrilla forms of warfare. The state volunteer regiments engaged their Filipino adversaries in conventional set-piece battles and were highly successful. The federal volunteers who replaced them witnessed the change in the nature of the Philippine conflict from conventional warfare between opposing formations of soldiers to guerrilla warfare of ambush and intimidation of the civilian population. They effectively adopted successful counterinsurgency tactics that ultimately led to the pacification of much of the Philippines by mid-1901 when the replacement volunteer regiments were disbanded and the remaining pacification task uh, 
fell to a reconstituted and expanded regular army, the Philippine Scouts, and the Philippine Constabulary. The volunteers of both 1898 and 1899 were highly motivated individuals who were imbued with a strong sense of duty to their country, enthusiasm for an adventuresome life, and remarkable personal courage and physical durability. Without the high quality of the volunteer soldiers, Reed maintains that the Philippine-American War would have been fought with, quote, less well-trained troops, fewer districts would have been pacified in the winter of 1900-1901, and the harsh punitive measures used by the regulars of 1902 in certain places in the islands would have been employed on a much wider scale. The war would thus have disrupted more communities and consumed more human lives, both American and Filipino, end quote. And it is very likely it would have taken more time to achieve pacification. The U.S. volunteers who campaigned in the Philippines in 1900 and 1901 effectively constituted the concept of an expansible force advocated by proponents of army reform following the Civil War. They represented the mobilization of a pool of trained men during times of national emergency, similar to the reservist system employed in several European armies of the late 19th century. This was essentially the reservist concept, not that of the National Guard, which was fragmented among the states of variable quality in terms of training and equipment, and was controlled by the states during peacetime and to a certain degree during times of war. The Army Bill of March 2nd, 1899, was the result of much debate over Army reform measures during the fall and winter of 1898 and into 1899. A central issue of this debate was the expansion of the Army to a size needed to pacify and administer America's new island dependencies, primarily the Philippine Islands. Although the bill fell short of the measures long sought by proponents of Army reforms, it represented a compromise between the advocates and opponents of Army reform. The law required that by July 1, 1901, the volunteer force would disband and the regular army of 65,000 men would shrink to about 29,000 officers and men, close to the army's total pre-Spanish War authorized strength. Reformers continued to push for organizational changes and expansion of the army's strength, which were finally authorized beginning early in 1901. As the historian Graham Cosmas has pointed out, the changes made in 1899 presaged modernization of the U.S. Army and were followed by a series of important legislative reforms in both the Army and the National Guard that began in 1901 and continued to the advent of the First World War. One final note about Wallace Taylor. I mentioned that he stayed in the Philippines after he left the Volunteers in 1901. In July of that year, a civil government replaced the military government in the Philippines. Soon after that, a national police force was formed to suppress insurrection and banditry and generally maintain law and order in the islands. The U.S. Army took a diminished and less visible role in the American occupation of the Philippines, except in certain areas. This new police force was called the Philippine Constabulary. Most of the officers of the constabulary were experienced American officers and ex-officers from the regular or volunteer forces. The constabulary was headed by a chief and four assistant chiefs, who in 1904 were given the ranks of brigadier general and colonel, respectively. Wallace Taylor joined the constabulary during the summer of 1901 as one of the first assistant chiefs, and he retired from the constabulary in 1916 when he returned to, to the United States. He saw much action and achieved a much envied reputation as one of the legendary fighting officers of the constabulary. He also was awarded the highest decoration for bravery that could be bestowed by the Philippine government. On Samar in 1905, a constabulary company led by Colonel Taylor was attacked by a large body of bandits. Taylor was severely wounded in the jaw, but he maintained consciousness and refused to leave the field until all of the bandits were repulsed. A 45 caliber bullet entered his mouth and came out the side of his jaw. It was two days before he received medical attention and a week before he could be treated in a hospital. In the interim, his men provided him with nourishment by letting the contents of raw bird's eggs sop down his throat. His condition was complicated by a fall during the night following the wounding, which resulted in a broken clavicle. 
For this action, he received the constabulary's highest decoration, the Medal for Valor, which was awarded only 81 times uh, from its inception in 1901 through 1980. Four of those awards were symbolic to Douglas MacArthur, Chester Nimitz, Jonathan Wainwright, and the unknown Filipino soldier. Thus, Wallace Taylor finally received some of the recognition that had largely eluded him during his earlier highly meritorious service in the U.S. Volunteers. For 15 years, he was one of the most capable and effective officers of, of the constabulary. During most of his time with the constabulary, he directed operations in the Visayan Islands, which is essentially the group of large islands in the central part of the archipelago. He saw a great deal of combat and in 1914 served as acting chief of the constabulary. I'll conclude by quoting a literary tribute paid to Wallace Taylor by one of his fellow constabulary officers, John R. White, whose career, in a sense, paralleled that of Taylor's. Born in England, he served in the U.S. Volunteers during the Philippine-American War and went into the constabulary in 1901 when Taylor did. He left the constabulary for health reasons in 1914 at the same rank as Taylor, a colonel, and he, like Taylor, also received the Medal for Valor. Interestingly enough, he was a National Park Service park superintendent from the 1920s into the late 1940s in charge of places like Yosemite and Grand Canyon National Parks. In 1928, he published this book, Bullets and Bolos, which was about his constabulary experiences. He much admired Wallace Taylor and described him in these glowing words, quote, panegyrics should be saved for the dead, but I must at least speak of the impression that the Bayard of the constabulary made on me. Our work almost daily provided acid tests, which showed up men in whom there was too much base metal. So we did not lack brave officers. Yet Colonel Taylor was as conspicuous as a newly minted $5 gold piece in a handful of old copper cents. Wherever the Pulahanis were thickest, wherever the hiking was hardest, wherever the odds were greatest against the constabulary, there he was to be found, inspiring by his courage, but no less by his courtesy and fine manner of life. My last slide shows a reunion of uh, uh, former soldiers of the 39th U.S. Volunteers in 1938, a year before uh, Taylor died. Taylor is sitting right here. Uh, thank you. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Did come back to Nebraska? No. The question is, uh, did Taylor come back to Nebraska after he returned from the Philippines? Uh, he did not. He and, um, he and a brother had planned for years to buy land in California near uh, L.A. and uh, start raising citrus plants. And so they became citrus farmers. Uh, his parents, uh, Cadet Taylor and Mrs. Taylor, moved to California at the same time in 1916. The family all came together on this one citrus farm in California, and they stayed there. Uh, the, um, uh, the family was kind of a, re a very remarkable family. Cadet Taylor was well-connected politically uh, throughout his life. After he moved to California, he was elected to the California legislature. Uh, the, Taylor's older brother, Herb, uh, when he was in high school in the uh, 1880s, spent his summers working with John Wesley Powell in the, in the Southwest on those exploring expeditions. When I uh, presented this talk in, uh, at Fort Robinson uh, about four years ago, uh, Taylor's uh, daughter uh, attended the talk with four generations of her family. He had two sons and a daughter, and the daughter was still living then, and I hoped she is still living. When did the Philippines get their independence? I believe it was in 1946, as after the end of World War II. That question was, when did the Philippines receive their independence? Well, thank you. <laughs>